the Parks and Recreation Department. I am Dylan Vanderford, Chairman of the Parks and, and Recreation Advisory Board. We have with us this evening Mr. Jose Escobedo. He's a board member. We have Mr. Nathan Burkhart, who is also a member. We have Mr. Roy De Los Santos, representing the Midi Cultural District. He is their chairman of the board. We have Tara Putnat next to him, representing the Brownsville Historical Museum, and she is their executive director, is that correct? Okay. Historic Association, I'm sorry. And we have Mr. Tony Knopp, who is a board member and is going to give us a little history before we get started this evening. So with that, Mr. Knopp, would you approach the podium and give us a little history on the Jefferson Davis Memorial in Brownsville, Texas? Thanks very much. Uh, get out some few notes here. Uh, the Jefferson Davis Highway is what started all this and it dates back to 1913 uh, when the United Daughters of the Confederacy uh, decided that they wanted to have a comparable route to one that had been announced a year earlier, uh, the Abraham Lincoln Highway, which was to travel through the northern states, and then there would be the Jefferson Davis Highway, which would travel through the southern states. Uh, designated route, really. And this was not at all uncommon back at this time for organizations not necessarily government affiliated to try to have some kind of a route which would promote uh, the development of the route and the building of the highways. Because remember, this was back in 1912 and 13 when highways were just starting to really get underway. Other examples of this, uh, this highway tendency was the uh, Southern National Highway, the Lone Star Trail, the King of Trails, and the Puget Sound to the Gulf. So very common kind of thing to be doing. Uh, eventually, the Jefferson Davis Highway extended all the way to uh, the Canadian border over in, over in the, the Northwest, and it, it, the route seemed to change and was indeed kind of confusing at times. Uh, by 1925, however, there was so many, conf well, I don't know, competing routes and roads and so on that the U.S. government decided to develop a highway system using numbers. Uh, so from then on, it was pretty much up to the states to designate uh, highways that they wanted to have names for, and many of the southern states did indeed adopt the Jefferson Davis uh, Highway as a name for the route within their states. Uh, Brownsville was designated as the southern terminus of the Jefferson Davis Highway, and that's what went caused the, the rise or the beginning of the United Daughters of the Confederacy chapter in Brownsville. That occurred in 1925 when they decided to have the southern terminus here in Brownsville in order to accept, quote, a national monument that would be located at Palm and Elizabeth Streets. Uh, so the daughters were formed at that time for that reason. Uh, the Jefferson Davis Highway Committee recommended a granite boulder at Port Isabel to commemorate the landing of Davis and his uh, Mississippi volunteers. These were, this was a rifle uh, entity back at the early part of the Mexican-American War, but it, it didn't wind up being there at Port Isabel. Uh, instead, it was to be located in Brownsville, and the estimated expense of the monument was $1,500. It would be 12 to 15 tons, and it would be granite boulder with some smaller boulders to set it in from the Davis Mountain area out in uh, West Texas. 
I suppose because the Davis Mountains and the uh, Fort Davis out there were named for Jefferson Davis. So that's how it all came about. I might add a little comment on my own that uh, I do uh, walking tours in Brownsville and one of them goes through Washington Park and I point out the uh, uh, Miguel Hidalgo bust and the Rincon Martiano and the uh, photograph on the uh, Putinat School, a photograph of the old grammar school, and the Jefferson Davis Memorial. And uh, the tourists uh, seem to find it interesting that we have so much uh, diversity, <laughs> and in a temporal sense as well, because this is reflecting this, this uh, Jefferson Davis monument reflects uh, attitudes back in the 1920s. So I think that's the story, at least as far as I have it. <coughs> Thank you for that. Here in a minute, we're going to move into the public portion where you all will have an opportunity to comment. I'd like to lay out some ground rules that are pretty common knowledge. Uh, I'd like everyone to, of course, keep their comments respectful. Uh, the order of speakers will be based on the cards that uh, you signed at registration. When you approach the mic, please speak clearly so we can all hear you. Give your name, and if you are representing an organization, the name of the organization. We will be limited to three minutes, and you will receive a warning at the two-minute mark. Uh, last thing is we do have a limited amount of time here. I would like to be able to hear everybody <coughs> speak, so please be wary of the time limit. Uh, with that, if there are any questions, or there are no questions, we can go ahead and start. Very good. Uh, first up, we have Doris. First up, we have Doris. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know her last name. Minor day. Minor day? Excuse me, uh, my name is Doris Minerding. I uh, currently live in Laguna Vista. I'm from Ohio. Um, I typically do not speak at any of the events I go to, um, primarily because I consider myself an Anglo outsider, and I do not feel that it is my um, duty to do so or my privilege to do so. However, I feel that Confederate monuments are a national not a local problem. Um, the Confederacy, Confederate monuments, I made a few notes hastily, um, honor those who fought to maintain slavery. I often hear that somewhere that history is being rewritten, and even in history books, we are teaching our children that this is not true. However, here, I do have, which I just printed before I came here, the letter of secession, secession from Texas that was ratified at a state convention in 1861, pulling them out of the um, United States of America. There is only one reason listed in their letter as to why they are seceding, and that is slavery. If you wish to withhold or uphold and to continue to honor something so horrendous in our past. We will never heal, we will never be one. And in an area where so many people are already <laughs> um, discriminated against, I would think that you would want to pull together and become one with the country. Thank you. My name is Calvin Walker. I'm president of the Brownsville Historical Association. The Brownsville Historical Association is proud to serve its mission to preserve, educate, and promote the history, heritage, and cultural arts of Brownsville. By preserving all assets of our local history, we strive to tell the true story of our place in every aspect. 
Brownsville's rich history tells a story of a border town that has withstood the Mexican-American War, bandit raids, the Civil War, and many other events that have held significance for the state of Texas, the United States, and many other parts of the world. It's our great responsibility to assist in preserving our historical sites and in turn educating visitors to our city of our history. On behalf of the Board of Directors, we devote our association to the full commitment of preserving all historic places, monuments, buildings, artifacts, and archives that help tell the storied history of Brownsville and its environs. Now I'd like to step aside uh, my position as president and I'd like to make a brief comment as an ordinary Brownsville citizen. I personally believe it's a slippery slope to view the events of 150 years ago or even 50 years ago through the lenses of today's society. None of us in this room were around during the Civil War and the men and the brothers who fought against each other in that terrible conflict did so without our perspective of today. Slavery is a horrible human condition, but in some parts of this world, it still exists. Let's not remove this dark stain from our history books, but instead study it, learn from it, and work to abolish it from the face of the earth. Thank you. We have Cesar uh, at the Leon. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, all of you for actually being volunteers with our great community. So with that, I'm going to start by saying that the heart of our community is deeply rooted in a history that has evolved for 150 years, a history both good and evil. A history which includes the stories and lives of the Coquitlan, Atlan, Lipan, Apaches, Comanches, French, Spanish, Cubans, South and Central Americans, and now Jewish communities, Filipino and Middle Eastern communities that all reside in our great community. Browns was truly a city of many nations and cultures, the proverbial melting pot. We exemplify the unique American motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many we are one. But there are also other truths that our city that we must confront. We were in the middle of the Mexican-American War. We were in the forefront of the Civil War. This is a town where Gerald Ford fought Juan Cortina and Porfirio Diaz planned the overthrow of a democratically elected government in Mexico. We have a dark past which includes wrongly accused minorities. We are a place where the courts and shrines separate but equal, where rangers would be and kill Mexican, Mexican-Americans, and people of color. So when people say to me that a monument such as Jefferson Davis Memorial Marker are history, well, what I just described is real history as well, and that is a searing truth. There is a difference between remembrance of history and reverence of it. President George W. Bush said at the dedication of the National Museum of African American History, a great nation does not hide its history, it faces its flaws and corrects them. So today I speak about a marker and how and why this process today can move us as a community towards healing and understanding of each other. So let's start with the facts. This marker is more than just stone and metal. They are not just innocent remembrance of a benign history. These monuments purposely celebrate a fictional sanitized history, ignoring a lot of evils that we all faced. After the Civil War, these statues were part of terrorism as much as burning a cross on someone's lawn or attacking on false allegations. These statues, as most attacks, were to send the wrong message to all who walked in their shadows and tried to bring change about who was still in charge in our community. From my perspective, even though I grew up in Brownsville and have a long history of fighting for equality, even though my blood contains Jewish, Koda Indian, Spanish, and Indian, Italian blood, I have passed Washington Park a million times, and I will be honest, I never gave it a second thought. So I'm not judging anybody, I'm not judging people. We all take our own journey on race. I just hope people share their thoughts on this particular marker. For me, I would like this marker to be relocated to a different place. We have considered, or I've thought about three different places, and I would like everybody's input, including the advisory board, because one day we will take a vote on it. One of the places has been the Veterans Park, because all soldiers that fought in the Civil War are now veterans. The second place would be the Brownsville Historical Museum. And third and lastly, we could always relocate it to one of the many museums, including the Stillman House Museum. I know that this conversation will be tough, 
but you elected me to do the right thing, not the easy thing. And this is what this looks like. So I want to welcome everybody to please share their thoughts. Please give us your thoughts. And uh, eventually, I guess we will all take a vote as a community and uh, we will live with our history. So thank you. Good evening, my name is Teresa Saldivar. I'm a Brownsville resident. I am not a natural born Texan, I'm from California. Uh, I don't know much about the history of Texas, I've been reading about it. Um, that rock, plaque, all reasons for the Confederates, daughters of the Confederacy, whatever, all their reasons aside, that rock needs to be relocated to the historical museum. It has no place amongst our U.S. veterans. That would be offensive. They will be rolling in their graves to have a Confederate monument in a U.S. veteran's place of honor. To even think that is appalling. I hope you guys really, really take this into consideration how offensive that would be. I've been reading the comments by veterans and they don't agree with having it anywhere near our veterans. I mean, Davis fought against the U.S. and everything it stands for. It has no business being in our parts. And as people have been stating, it was used as a symbol during the Jim Crow era. So it just has no business being there. And nobody's rewriting history. Nobody's erasing history. Nobody's rewriting the history books to eliminate these people. History is history, it will always be there. It just needs the proper place. And that's in a historical museum and not in our parks. Thank you. Good evening, my name is uh, Juan C. Vega. I am a resident of Brownsville and I'm a middle school history teacher. I'm here that in that point of view, I'm a history teacher. I try to install a sense of freedom sense of, with my students, I've been teaching middle school for 17 years. I've taught here at Cummings Middle School before they decide to close us down, but now I teach another middle school. And I always refer to Palo Alto, Resaca de la Palma, Palmetto Hill, and Fort Brown, major Fort Brown that was killed there. And my point of view on the stone, Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. I talk about him in my history class. How I feel about keeping a the stone there, moving it, I'm still undecided. But I have two proposals I'd like to bring up to the committees and to the city. One, if you're gonna keep it there, it's an incomplete history, okay? If you're gonna keep the stone there, why don't you honor the other side? Literally, it's one-sided history. On the other side of the stone, why don't we put a plaque to honor the escaped slaves who escaped their freedom, the Underground Railroad, to Mexico, who already abolished slavery. Or honor, maybe I'm mistaken with uh, Dr. Knopp here, he can correct me, but honor a local Tejano Civil War hero like Santo Benavides, who, am I mistaken, did might have fought at Palmetto Hill. So if you're gonna keep it as a historical landmarker, but there in itself, there's a problem. It is not a historical landmark. It has no significant landmark value. It is not like the Battle of Palmetto Hill or the Sac de la Palma, which is the location where people actually died, okay? Uh, Jefferson Davis did stay, I believe, in a home downtown somewhere in Brownsville. There's a, say, supposedly he slept here for a night, but there you go. It offers no significant historical value. But if you're gonna keep it a historical landmark, regardless of it moving to one of the historical museums or the whatever else in town, it's an incomplete history. This, if we decide to put a plaque on the other side to honor the slaves who escaped their freedom to Mexico, we can start a GoFundMe page and Brownsville can donate its uh, liberty, its uh, labor to co correct it, okay? If you're gonna do it for a, a local Tejano uh, hero, maybe Dr. Knopf can help me out figure out if it's uh, Santo Benavides did fight a premier hero or not. So those are my two cents on this opinion. Thank you very much for listening to me.
What's up, everyone? Hello. Um, I'm uh, Christopher Gracia. I'm a high school student. And uh, I guess history seems to be the recurring uh, theme here, so I guess I'd uh, have a whack at it. Um, to give a little bit about Jefferson Davis, he was not just uh, the Confederate president, but he was really more American than he was Confederate. He uh, fought in the Mexican-American War, and uh, among other things. But that's probably the uh, the staple, uh, the uh, the hallmark, uh, the highlight of his um, career. Because if he and people like him did not do that, we wouldn't be a part of the greatest country in the world, which is America. We would be a part of Mexico. Uh, next, uh, the point, the really main point I wanted to make was that uh, the removals of these monuments is not going to stop Jefferson Davis. Uh, you know, monuments like those to um, uh, Christopher Columbus and um, George Washington, even the first president, have been defaced, and people have uh, requested that they be removed. Now, um, by the time the people who want these monuments removed, by the time they're finished, America will have been stripped of its heritage and identity. Now, I think it's our duty as uh, patriots and the people who are in this country to uh, protect, protect our culture and uh, our identity as a country from anybody who wants to remove it. And uh, as far as suggestions to make, um, two things to two different groups of people. For the people who make the decision, I would say uh, keep the monument because uh, it's just a rock, not hurting anyone. Uh, and uh, we also must protect our, our history and our heritage and our culture. And the uh, other suggestion I'd like to make to anybody who wants to remove this monument, you know, to make any of them feel better, I guess you could say, if, you know, this, if America's culture is just st so offensive, so grotesque, I suggest maybe move to Mexico. Thank you. So um, since I only have three minutes, I'm going to make this really quick. A quick question and answer with myself. What was the first thing we did when we came into this and we started this event? We pledged allegiance to the flag. What was the last phrase in the pledge? With liberty and justice for all. Now, I really hope that you all you know, uh, pledge allegiance uh, sincerely. But there is one person who is the main focus of this event who does not believe in um, liberty and justice for all, and that was Jefferson Davis. Now, I am reading this from a website, uh, the Confederate Partisan, and on this very same page, it's, uh, it starts off with, on this page, I will post quotes from our first president. Mr. Davis was a great man and a patriot that served his country with a sense of honor and duty. And I will scroll down. It says, Jefferson Davis quotes on slavery. Uh, African slavery, as it exists in the United States, is a moral, social, and political blessing. My own convictions as to, and yeah, I mean, I'm not sure exactly where the, you know, what words are appropriate now, you know, but, you know, my own convictions as to Negro slavery are strong. We recognize the Negro as God and God's book and God's laws in nature tell us to recognize him. Our inferior, fitted expressly for servitude. Now, if you all are, um, you know, putting your hand to your chest when you pledge allegiance, and you feel that this rock commemorating this historically known racist and white supremacist deserves to stay in a public area, I will suggest you either keep your hand down or, you know, not recite the part that says with liberty and justice for all because, you know, it's, it, it, they don't mix well. Um, I've, I've been following this uh, story for the last almost two years. Uh, I wrote a few articles on a, on a blog. Um, I'm not sure if it's against the rules to say the name of it, but I write for Brownsville Bright. And I've written a few articles about how Brownsville has basically just ignored the fact that we have this monument to a racist, white supremacist traitor. Um, I'm hoping that 
this town hall, this will be the first time that we actually see Brownsville do something about it. And since everybody's throwing proposals around, I, you know, I, I feel for uh, the Confederates in the room, if you all want to keep your monument, I suggest you can move it to an area that the Confederacy has claimed. Oh, wait a minute. Right, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Eugene Fernandez, and I'm more than anything here to represent the uh, Cameron County Historical Commission. The one thing that I see so tragic in this type of event, and I've seen it all over this country and all over the world, I'm going to bring out Syria. I'm going to bring out the heinous acts that have occurred in other parts of this country. They are not so much based on a rock an inanimate object. They are based on people's limited concept of how we should treat each other and the ever rearing head of hatred. Now, we have to keep this out of this particular movement because it's wrong. If somebody comes up to a statue and of any creed, and by the way, this country says that we honor creeds. And they spray paint it, or they demolish it, they deface it, that's wrong. We've got to keep this civilized. We have some proposals in order to suggest where it should be placed. This is not a monument for slavery. There is nothing on this that says we are embracing slavery. Peoples of the world, have a right to honor their dead. If you go to Germany, if you go to Japan, weren't they allowed to honor their dead? Many of the fighters that were involved in the slavery, for one reason or the next, may not have agreed or disagreed with it. It was a movement that happened. And again, as several people in this room have pointed out, these were different times, far different times. Now. We have a proposal to change the name Washington Park. Washington owns slaves. Do you see how convoluted all of this can get? So let's keep honor in it. Let's keep dignity. And uh, let's just be hopeful that the right decision will be made at the end. Thank you. Hey, Chris, this uh, country was built on its people's ability to change. So if you don't like it, maybe you should get out. Your comments to the day is a, historic to site, the a historic site or object is an official location or pieces of political, military, cultural, or social history which have been preserved due to their cultural heritage value. In this case, there is not an official position on the morality of the issue. It's an objective look at, something, at some mementos from a different time that can help us learn about it and understand the context. A monument, by definition, is a building, statue, or location that honors a person or event. This inherently takes a position or a subjective look at history. It chooses a side. The history of the Civil War is not one in which the facts are murky or disputed, not by any serious historian, anyway. The Confederacy renounced their country and died in the tens of thousands to protect the institution of slavery. This was, beyond any reasonable doubt, their motive to secede. This is verifiable by multiple means, but it's frankly unnecessarily complicated when you can actually read the secession declarations or other documents in which each, of one of the each one of the states cites the preservation of slavery as the primary motive. Having said this, inevitably, one has to assume that if you have reverence for anybody who of their own volition fought for the Confederacy, you are either misinformed on facts of the conflict or you are being intellectually dishonest about it. If in the best of cases you are misinformed, I can understand because that is without a doubt a product of a very large project designed to do just that. Shortly after the Confederacy was defeated by the Union, an ideological movement was born called the Lost Cause. This was possible because as we all can see, slavery ended but white supremacy did not. 
As soon as these people put down their arms, they picked up their pens and continued the civil war in the intellectual field, launching a national effort to rewrite and reframe, uh, and reframe their motives and actions. More than any other entity, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, a group formed of wealthy descendants of Confederate soldiers and wives of prominent politicians, allocated a monumental, no pun intended, amount of financial resources and political influence to revise the history of the Civil War and to disseminate the result throughout our culture. Most of these monuments, including our very own Jefferson Davis Monument, were erected by them. You can argue that their efforts were an educational endeavor, but you would be misusing the word. They effectively banned schools and public libraries any book that framed the South negatively. They forced their own books as textbooks in public schools and created camps in which they would teach children pro Confederate propaganda. I would offer that this is not so much education as it is indoctrination. It is revisionism. You see, one of the main and more insidious objectives of the lost cause was to reframe slavery as a benevolent institution instead of the Holocaust that it in reality was as well as lying about the fact that the South seceded primor primordially to protect slavery. This Sorry, movement- your time is up. You have and an opportunity to show which vision of me. history do you all endorse. And ladies and gentlemen, hang on. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you all, you guys are not here to debate with one another. Your comments should not be directed at previous speakers or speakers yet to come. Yeah, you're, you're here to give us your input. Speaking your mind is allowed. Attacking another speaker is not. Thank you. Cannot, you cannot donate time. Keep it civil. You keep it civil. Next we have I think the uh, elephant in the room is race. And for me, looking at that monument, which should be in a museum, I think of the 4,000 4, blacks lynched after the United States Civil War, how the promise of reconstruction was never fulfilled, the inordinate amount of blacks in American jails for nonviolent crimes, an absolute how should I say it, disregard of what the South wanted and how, like the speaker said before, once the Civil War ended, in a strange way, the North wins the war in the South. All you have to do is look at Fox News. They are winning the narrative. I think that Brownsville, by taking the plaque and putting it in a museum, will be a way to write or to begin to change a narrative that needs a lot of fixing. I am very, very sorry that the promises of Reconstruction and U.S. Grant, the saddest thing about his life was that he never fulfilled the promises of Reconstruction. And it's probably decent to say here, and I know it's going to offend some people, for me, when I look at the monument, I feel like screaming, Black Lives Matter. Thank you. And first of all, thank you all so much for having the town hall meeting. It is greatly appreciated. My name is Erasmo Castro, and I think uh, the focus in regards to the relocation of, of the monument is based on uh, the thought or the idea that there is a sentiment of racism behind it, and that is one of the reasons why it should be removed. Um, it is a sentiment, it is a way that is going throughout the country. It's not something new, it's not something only merited to Brownsville, Texas in itself. Uh, I think as a monument, we should look past it in regards to something that is physical and look deeper inside to see what is the spiritual essence of what is being debated here tonight. And uh, I think our concerns needs to focus more on mending a lot of things that may be broken in regards to, to our situations with race, uh, with uh, discord or with uh, what we find offensive uh, for our lives. Um, I personally uh, can say that I have 
never actually approached or read the plaque that is on the rock. And I will say that probably 90% of the individuals here in the city of Brownsville haven't done that either. I think when we start to, to lose track or lose focus in regards to what's really important for our city, I mean, look at all the resources that have been spent so far in regards to this monument. Uh, look at all uh, the hoopla that has been raised in regards to it. And I think that it's a way of distracting us from the true essence of what is important for our community. Uh, a couple of months back, uh, we have been addressing the city commission in regards to statements that have been made in regards to race, which I think that are in essence important. And I will use my last mountain time to read them. There are a couple of effing N words that Luis Sainz is getting, and I don't know where he's getting them from. They are coming down to my effing city, and now they are trying to effing put everyone in jail because they think we're a bunch of Mexicans that hear our wives, which couldn't be further from the effing truth. But that is how they see us. They are effing. And I will say this, that I would never dare use the word, but you know what? Yes. There are a couple of N-words, N-word, <laughs> in there and think that all of us are effing taco eaters. That is the real problem with our city. That is what needs to be removed. That is what needs to be relocated. We must take these sentiments out of our hearts, out of our souls, and focus on what's really important for our community. Removing a rock with a rusty place, with a rusty plaque on it, is in no way what is most important for our city and for our community. Thank you all so much. Next up, we have Jaime R. Garza. I'm Jaime Garza and I'm a descendant of the Benavides. Uh, just a few months ago, the San Diego uh, black was removed and we had no problems there. So I see that we could do the same thing here and move it to a museum. Uh, if you go to the Port Isabel, you'll see some of my relatives there. The other thing that a lot of people do not know that the, the actual fighting that was done here in, in Brownsville and in Palo Alto were done by Tejanos. They were not Confederate soldiers from Alabama and all those, the other places. They were from Texas. That's all I have to say. Next up, we have Jesse Miller. Good, e good evening, everyone. My name is Jesse Miller, and I live on Adams Street, right across the street from Washington Park. And when I walk out my front door, I see this stone. I don't believe that removing this uh, plaque in the stone is a hard choice. The stone has no real historical significance to Brownsville. During the Mexican-American War, before Brownsville was a town, Jefferson Davis landed at Point Isabel and floated up the river to Camargo on his way to fight in the war with Zachary Taylor. But that's, those are the, the historical facts. There's a bigger picture that, that brings a lot of us here tonight. Confederate monuments were constructed with a handful of motives, but one of them was to visually formalize the idea of white supremacy. But this formalization of white supremacy wasn't as flagrant as the methods of the KKK across the South or the Texas Rangers locally during the Montanza. Confederate monuments are a more passive approach to formalizing white supremacy. The United Daughters of the Confederacy res were responsible for most of the Confederate monuments including the one in question today. The daughters made monuments because they could claim it was about preserving history, but it wasn't as simple as that. 
It was part of a broader mov movement known as the Lost Cause, which was essentially to whitewash Southern and Confederate history. The Lost Cause said Southern slaveholders were benevolent to their slaves. The Lost Cause said that black people were better off as slaves to the white slaveholders than being free. The Lost Cause movement influenced textbooks across the South, further spreading this false history. The daughters set out to permanently memorialize this way of thinking with monuments. They even started a highway named the Je Jefferson Davis Highway that celebrated white supremacy. And this is where Brownsville comes in. They placed that stone to Jefferson Davis at the southern terminus of that imagined road at the intersection of Palm Boulevard and Elizabeth Street. They justified this stone based on the fact that the man once floated by here on the Rio Grande. Some people have decided to ignore the motives of the daughters of the Confederacy and say that Confederate monuments help us remember the past so we don't re repeat our mistakes. Some people feel good believing this. I don't believe it's a justified view. But to see the full big picture, let's also remember that 12 of the US presidents own slaves, eight of them while in office. The US has a lot of work to do to dismantle systemic racism in many ways, but removing monuments to white supremacy is one simple step. I don't believe that rock deserves any place in public view. Thanks. Next up, we have Ernesto Gámez, the floor. Uh, good evening, I'm Ernesto Gámez, and I'm here to actually take the position to stay. Now here's the thing, we actually have two semi-monuments in this room that have a long history of slavery. That flag and that flag. And I don't think anyone in this room wants to remove those. We have a long history of oppression. Some would say the United States was an ethno state until the Civil Rights Act, but no one wants to change those flags. You see videos all the time on social media of those actually burning the United States flag. And I think everyone in this room thinks it's disgusting when they see that. Now about the issue of we have a Confederate state and the actual United States fighting each other. They're both American sides. The last word in the Confederate States of America is America. They're both Americans. Over half a million people died fighting in this war. To remove this monument is actually an insult to those who fought, who those who were drafted on both sides. Because we have people from this very city and from this state that fought in the war on the side of the Confederacy. Yes, we can say Jefferson Davis was a terrible person and that many, many people that fought in that war were terrible people on that side. But the thing is, many people, many of them, our ancestors, died on that side. To remove it is a start of erasing history. We have people say that it's not, but in reality, it is. Because even our president said, and we have many people in this state, in the valley, that have a lot of animosity towards him, but there are people that spoke who I can say have a lot of great ideas and some who actually have opinions that I agree with. You cannot like someone and actually agree with some things he said. And one thing he actually said was if it's starting with Lee and Davis, eventually it'll get to Jefferson and Washington. You can disagree with every policy the president has. That's actually true though, because we have people that burn that flag. We have people that want to actually rename some of these places and people that reject slavery have actually made comments about Washington, have actually made comments about our presidents owning slaves, but no one's gonna start attacking our country's founders, are they? I, I hope that we can come to a decision to say that we're gonna hear, we're here to promote our history. We had an issue also brought up that a plaque was removed and no one took notice of it. That's not because no one cared. It's because we don't promote our history enough. And by removing it, we're not promoting our history. Heck, we even had a mayor who fought for the Confederacy. Not enough people know that. Why don't we promote more of our history? Uh, hi, my name is Malcolm. I'm a student here. I also work, um, I work seasonally for the Parks and Rec Department as a lifeguard. Um, uh, I'm a proud Texan and I'm a proud Brownsvillian. I think it's important that we hold our history to high, high regards, but the problem here tonight, though, is that 
we've been told that this argument is about honoring history or not. And the fact is that um, this is an argument about honoring a certain person or um, accurately representing a traitorous man who was detrimental to the South. Um, it's important to remember who this man was, like in a museum, but honoring him with a monument is a false narrative to the actual and very evil actions that he committed. As, uh, as Southerners, this man w does not represent us, and he belongs in history and not in our parks. Um, I think that it's important that we just kind of remember that um, as, a, as a community, we need to look out for each other, and if there's a group of people who are saying that something's hurting them or it's being disrespectful of them, I, I think it's our duty as, as neighbors and as friends to, to really listen to that. So I just hope that everyone really thinks of each other as, as friends and not, and not a group of people who's trying to, to hurt each other, but, but people who, are, who care about, about uh, the true history, which is not one that holds uh, Jefferson Davis to high regards, but one that shows him at who he really was. And um, that's, a, that's a trait to our country, and, and that's someone that should be sat in a museum, just um, like the Brownsville Historical Museum, which is a block away from the current Jefferson site. So uh, I hope that um, we can come to a conclusion about that. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Jason Shiplett. I'm actually kind of new to the Valley. I've been here about nine years now. My wife brought me here. I didn't know Brownsville was on a map till I met her. All right, so I've been learning a lot of history of Brownsville and seeing this rock on Facebook and a couple other social medias, I've learned a little bit more about Brownsville, a lot more history. Before I came here and debate on what's right or wrong or type up why I typed up, I learned even more about history of Brownsville. So I'm glad to stay in here today I have my son here to learn what town halls are and stuff like that for educational purposes. But it's a lot of history, Jefferson Davis. Yes, he was the president of the Confederacy. He was also a representative for his state. He was also a, a state representative, too. He was also a Democrat. He was on the, one of the six people that were going to be on a, a ballot for the Democrat Party sort of presidency. He did not take it, and... Um, Make sure I get the name correctly here. The person that took the ballot was, uh, I believe, uh, President Polk, which is a Democrat. He won that presidency before the Confederacy battle. Uh, Mr. Jefferson Davis, he became Confederacy. Yeah, he had slaves. Yes, he was fighting for slaves. But he also was fighting for local communities like this community to have more rights than the federal government, along with the states have more rights than the federal government. History could have been different if he was president than Mr. Uh, president Polk. Yes, Jefferson Davis, he fought for Brownsville, for the border of Mexico and the Texas where it was gonna be. Who knows, Brownsville could actually have been in Mexico and Texas started in Corpus Christi. So yes, he, there is a lot of history for him through Brownsville here. And um, after a conference, he was captured was in prison and the North and South, North and the South were fighting to get him out of jail, basically. He got out, he had immigration issues at that point. Like many, many people in the Valley here, they have immigration purposes and issues. He had the exact same thing. And then another president gave a lot of Confederacies um, the right to be veterans. And it's actually a crime if you go and violate a veteran's memorial or move the, uh, the thing like that. So moving that, I think, would be bad. I'll walk around town. My son will ask me, Dad, what's that? What's this? I can't always go to the museum because my business hours. So I'm able to tell him a little bit about Brownsville. Some people can't afford to go to a museum. So people can learn more about Brownsville. That's really all I have to say, and I hope it stays where it is. Next up, we have Michelle Carano.
Uh, good evening. Um, just want to let everybody know that um, today's a very good day to call your senators or email your senators about uh, museum advocacy in terms of donations. I noticed that a lot of people here work for museums and uh, new changes in uh, the new tax reform law will be affecting that. So just so you know, I too work at a museum. I won't be naming which one it is because I'm here to represent myself and not what they think. <clears throat> so, I had it written down. I gotta pull it up. <clears throat> so, I, I, just a couple bullet points here. First one, um, the Daughters of Confederacy ran a successful PR campaign back in whenever they put that thing up, 1915, 20, whatever. Uh, to smooth over their socialite, um, um, their socialite standings, make themselves look better for everybody. Basically, that's what it was. If you can think of any reason why people need to put up pretty things, it's to make, some, make them look good. Um, they put their name on there, the da Daughters of Confederacy, that to me is an indication of propaganda. Um, the stuff they say about um, the fellow that we're all fighting about right now. All propaganda. Uh, he's a great guy, yada yada. But in all, in, all sense, in all senses, the guy was fighting to keep slavery. And me, having a, about a quarter percentage of black inside of me, it's kind of offensive to hear people say, oh, no, no, no. It's, it's more of a history thing. No, no, brah. It, to me, it, it matters more that we acknowledge and that we change those things. Uh, moving forward really quick to the next one. Uh, let's follow suit. Nationwide and statewide they're removing statues. Let's do the same thing here. And last, um, I want to point out that we must be mindful of appeals to keep the rock at the Washington Park or putting it at the Veterans Park or anything like that because when we think about the people who want to keep it there, we need to understand where their perspective's coming from and what they stand to lose if it gets moved. You just got to think about it. That's all I got to say. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eddie Padron, and I was born and raised in Brownsville. My family has been here for more than 100 years. 100 years ago, this year, my grandfather was drafted for World War I at uh, Fort Brown. I know the history of Brownsville, I love the history of Brownsville, and I want to preserve the history of Brownsville. This rock is my friend. I grew up in Brownsville. I used to sit on top of it to watch the Tower Days parades. Now, I know some of you hate what the rock stands for, but it's just history. There was a man named uh, Martin Luther King who said, I have a dream, and Jefferson Davis lost. Martin Luther King won. Because in my, fa in my family, I have uh, members named Padron that are lily white, blue-eyed and blonde-haired. And in my family, I have a niece that is black, beautiful and black. That means that my family has become part of America and I am white, black, Hispanic, whatever. Martin Luther King, you won. The Rock is my friend and it is a part of history. In the history of Brownsville, there is a lot of, of uh, anti-black anti because it's part of history. Now you wanna attack the Rock? Let's not end there. Elizabeth Street is the main street of Brownsville, named for Elizabeth Stillman. Elizabeth Stillman, the Stillman House on Washington Street. She had a, a slave. She was a gift from her mother. In the Stillman House, there was a slave. Let's go burn it down. Dancy Building, which is the Cameron County Courthouse, it had, uh, 
uh, bathrooms where on, uh, for blacks and bathrooms for white. How dare they? Let's go burn it down. Brownsville Independent School District. There was a teacher named Pew, no, uh, Pullum. She was also, uh, uh, she had interaction because she was a fifth grade teacher. And there's a story where I knew that lady because uh, I think she was a wonderful, wonderful teacher. She was black. I never thought about that. I just thought about her as a teacher. So you can't change the history, but Brownsville Independent School District separated the children. They segregated the blacks and they had the whites and Hispanics in different schools. Uh, Mrs. Pullum had to teach the children that were black in a, in a school room all by themselves because the railroad had a lot of people that were black that lived here in Brownsville. They used to live on Fronton Street. My mom lived a block away from them and they had a segregated school. Blacks could not come to, to Brownsville and go to any hotel. There was a house on Fronton I'm Street. Sorry, your time is up. Well, may I just say that let's make a better future. Forget about the past. Make a better future. Leave the rock alone. It's not going to do anything. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a native Texan. My parents have been here since the 1840s. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what everybody's reading out of their phones. I'm gonna read from the heart. One, the rock is a rock. Like the gentleman said, it's not hurting anything. If you wanna move it, move it to the veteran. I'm a veteran. I was in the uh, Army in uh, 68 and 69. I was in a RABCOM. Nowadays they call it NORAD. I have a top secret clearance. In the 80s, I got laid off from the railroad. I went back into the Army. Twice I've served underneath that flag and I salute that flag have nothing against it. That flag, 200 years under slavery. The Confederate flag, not so many years, a few. That flag, under slavery. I salute that flag too. I'm a Texan, I'm here. What these people have been saying, uh, they're, getting, they're reading out of context. The Rock. Have you read The Rock? Have y'all? Y'all know what's on it? Anything about the Civil War? Is there anything about the Civil War? I ask. There is not. It's the gentleman. Let me tell you about the gentleman. He served the United States federal government. He was a good soldier. As one vet to another vet. If you want to move him from Washington Park, move to the Veterans Park. I got you. I'm going to ask you this. Think of the vet. Slavery was bad. Never should have been here. When Lincoln saw that the South had lost, what did he ask? Play Dixie. They played Dixie. Jefferson Davis was in prison, but never convicted of treason or anything else. He was set free. May I ask a question of the panel? How many vets are up there? None? Okay, well, I was gonna thank you for your service, but <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Veterans Park. If anything. Next up, we have Richard D. Nichols. Richard D. No, Richard D.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Ruben Cordova. I'm a U.S. Navy uh, retired. I did 22 years in the Navy from 77 to 99. I'm also uh, with a v uh, lifetime member with the uh, VFW. I've also, I'm also the commander of the uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans. Uh, one of the reasons that I support the Sons of Confederate Veterans is because my family has served Texas, and not only Texas, but the United States throughout history. I am also Lipan Apache. My family that uh, served in the Civil War were, uh, were scouts, Indian scouts for Santos Benavides. He patrolled everything from Brownsville to, to Eagle Pass. And one of the things is that a lot of people think that this was about slavery. It was, but it was only the politicians that wanted to have slavery. All the other ones that were soldiers, like me, fought for our rights and for our, our land, not for slavery. So you have to have two things. You can hate the politicians like we hate them now, or we can, or we can uh, uh, and, and support our troops like we do now. Our troops are what depends on this thing. These monuments are not meant to be portraying the, uh, the, the, the soldier that's on the monument, but the people that fought under them. These are like the unknown soldiers. A lot of these are men that came from Texas, which was the mightiest uh, force that uh, General Lee had. They fought and died in other uh, parts of the United States. Their bodies never came back. These are for remembrance of those people, not about slavery. They're not, they didn't die for slavery. They died because they were protecting their land. So with that, I say I'm propositioning that it gets moved to uh, Veterans Park, and we, we, the Sons of Confederate Veterans, with the Daughters of the uh, uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy, will pay for everything to have it moved to Veterans Park. Thank you. Roberto Resti, if the rock could speak, it would say, what did I do wrong? <laughs> if you take up the plaque and put it in the museum, nobody will go see it. Because I was one of the directors of the Stillman Museum, and we don't get nobody to come to any of the museums in Brownsville. <laughs> If we get two people a week, it was uh, you know, overwhelming, okay? I think what happened now is that, number one, a lot of people have been brought up with hate, and I was brought up not hating nobody, okay? And this group of people, they hate this plaque, this gentleman. He was a senator, a House of Representative, and he got to be president of the Confederate States of America. If you go see the plaque, the only thing it says there is CAS, and many people don't know what it means. Okay? That's it. Now, if you take off the plaque and put it in the museum, you can put the rock at my house. It will be very nice. <laughs> okay? I would love to have that rock. But these haters will probably go to my house and start stoning my house because they hate that rock. Now, I don't know if they hate the rock or they hate the plaque or they hate the gentleman. You have to understand that as a history teacher for 27 years, a lot of teachers don't even mention Jefferson Davis in the history books. He's mentioned just as president, and that's it. That's it. They mentioned more Lee and Lincoln and Grant. Okay? Very simple. So if you want to move it, it's not, it's not going to change anything, basically. Nothing. Even my own father, who served in two wars, cannot get his name at the Veterans Park, and I've been fighting. And it hurts me more. So these people that come with hate were brought up with hate, and that is so sad. Brownsville 
has so much history, but nobody knows about it. Thank you. Well spoken. I'm a United States veteran. I served my country. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. I fought for that flag and I fought for that flag. I have 17 Union veterans. I have 13 Confederate veterans. Do I deny one side versus the other? I ask you today, are we to erase our own family's history? As the, the man so eloquently spoke before me, do we give in to haters who hate a history that happened 150 years ago? Do we use the glasses of today's morals against Abraham Lincoln, who said that blacks should not have the right to vote? that blacks were not equal to the whites on any measure. Those racial and hateful words cannot be judged by today's morals and applied. Otherwise, we must remove the Washington Monument. We must remove the Lincoln Monument, the Jefferson Monument, change the names of our cities. Let me read a quote to you, and I think you'll remember this. Every record has been destroyed or falsified, every book rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street building has been renamed, every date has been altered, and the process is continuing day by day, minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. Do we give in to hatred? No. We learn from history, and I do. I do uh, understand that there is uh, uh, violence, uh, vandalism, uh, other thoughts uh, expressed here today, which I hope, like the previous speaker said, will go away and that this is an inanimate object and that we need to remember our history. And again, as a veteran, public law 85, 425, Confederate veterans are American veterans. Let's honor all veterans. And I was glad to serve my country. Sorry, I you, must I'm object sorry, really to the idea talk, that please. you are allowing other people to refer to other people as here, haters. It is wrong. It is one-sided. It is unfair. You tell us not to refer to other people, but you're allowing other people to refer to people as haters. So shut up. Next up, we have Don Lawrence. Can we please have civil discourse, please? Thank you. And we will have to kick you out if you have another outburst. Thank you. Uh, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen here tonight, my name is Don Lawrence. I am a veteran. Veteran. I served in World War II. I fought in the Battle of Britain starting on Friday, August the 13th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the first German forces came over to bomb Britain and London into submission. There was 400 and some bombers escorted by 142 fighters. We went up against them and came back. Then after the Battle of Britain, I was transferred to Bomber Command and I made 44 trips over enemy territory bombing them. <clears throat> now I'm not 
extremely proud of that because Germany has veterans just the same as we have veterans. But now veterans are something to be honored. <coughs> veterans from 1767 up until the present day have been honored by the United States government. In 1950, the United States government put forth a declaration and it is recorded in history in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., that all members of all forces, regardless of what army you were in, from 1767 up until today, are called veterans and will be honored as veterans, regardless of what campaign they were in. And your stone out here that you're talking about moving, whether it's a stone, a statue, a monument, or whatever it is, that is on hallowed ground. The reason it's called hallowed ground because that is a cenotaph. And a cenotaph is placed on a piece of ground that has been hallowed by the remains and the thoughts of those who did not make it back from the war. Their remains or their bodies were left someplace in the woods where they fell. They were buried in a mass grave someplace. Their name is not remembered. But somebody had, a, had the idea to put a piece of stone over a hallowed ground, and that is where those guys that did not make it home from any war, that is where they are remembered, right there. So please, remember these men. Remember these men. They fought and died for you even though you did not know them personally or anything else like that. But I'm sure you'd be proud to meet some of them. Now, in San Antonio, we have a Confederate cemetery, and would you believe that in that Confederate cemetery, we have a Union soldier buried there in amongst the veterans, and he gets all the treatment that our veterans do, our Confederate veterans do. He gets the same thing because he is a veteran. V-E-T-E-R-A-N, veteran. Don't ever forget that you may be a Sorry, veteran for two someday. I wear that name of veteran with pride. Pride, thank you. follow that. That's going to be tough. Hi, my name is Melissa Nur. I am here tonight to represent the United Daughters of the Confederacy. I um, pulled out the papers that were found in the uh, time capsule to prove ownership of the boulder and, and the plaque in question. Uh, I know some here tonight have mentioned about moving the plaque to the museum as an organization that we would uh, not be in agreement with. We would like the plaque and the boulder to remain as one. I become emotional, I'm sorry. Um, we would like to see the boulder moved with the plaque uh, to the Veterans Park, as others have already indicated. Jefferson Davis was a veteran, uh, Congress, recognize that fact that has already been spoken. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, do you have any questions for, for my organization? We will move the boulder with the plaque at no cost to the city. So you all would not have to worry about that. We've already made uh, arrangements. We just need the okay from the city to allow us to place the, the boulder with the plaque in uh, Veterans Park. So that's what, as an organization, we ask your committee. And thank you for that consideration. Next up, we have Yolanda Garza Burdua. Good evening. My name is Yolanda Garza Birdwell, and I am from Laguna Vista. I became, uh, we moved here from Houston seven years ago. 
We, uh, we work very actively in different uh, areas in the community. Many of my friends could not be here, but I can honestly say that I am represented about 5,000 people that signed a petition for Antonio Castillo to remove this monument. He is, has moved away from uh, Brownsville. He cannot be here, but he is the one that, that promoted or brought my attention to this situation. I understand that we all come from different areas. We all have read different books. We all have read, unfortunately, like uh, one person mentioned before, a revised history. I want you to understand revised history and remember colonization. My ancestors have been here 500 years. <laughs> the issue, it has been 91 years for this monument to be there, and it's a racist monument. This is a project of colonization that has worked work very well for those who want to keep the white supremacy control. <laughs> By keeping this monument to promote their power and using internalized racism, I saw it today, it breaks my heart to see internalized racism displayed very vivid here. And that is not acceptable. We cannot revise history. This, this object is a way to keep brown people down. And I, in this area, here in the Rio Grande Valley, we have a very good examples of these manifestations. We have gay keepers that work at the wall or the border patrol. The element of racism and hate we don't have it. They have it toward us, and it's promoted by the system that you all are glorifying today with Jefferson David. <laughs> Many of us are already very old. I have lived 77 years. I have dual citizenship from Mexico and also here, and I vote all the time. And I've been watching very closely how these elected officials are voting because uh, we're not gonna tolerate any more backwardness. We are behind in Brownsville 91 years. This, this monument is a racist monument from a, from a man that was a slaveholder and needs to be removed. Yes, we do have others that have a stained history. I'm sorry, but at this time is up. Thank you very much. Next, we have Walter B. Birdwell. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Being a veteran seems to be important to some people. U.S. Army 112th MI Group, 1964-1967, top secret clearance. And it doesn't have a thing to do with the issue we're discussing here, but if people think it's important, thank you. Like I said, uh, my name is Walter Birdwell. I'm from Laguna Vista. I'm here with others to advocate the removal of the Jefferson Davis uh, Monument in Washington Park from any public viewing. The reason is because Jefferson Davis was an unrepentant racist all of his life and said so. Let's look at some quotes to see what kind of man he was. Words out of his mouth. Slavery is a form of government instituted for a class of people not fit to govern themselves. February 29, 1860. An inferior race of peaceful, contented laborers. January 1, 1863. I have never asked for a pardon because a pardon requires repentance and I do not repent. February 20, uh, Jan, uh, 1878. Jefferson Davis was nothing but a traitor 
and should have died in a prison cell. Uh, to the United Sons and Daughters of the Confederacy, need Southern heroes. There is always James Longstreet who led an integrated militia after the Civil War and defeated the White Citizens Council in New Orleans. A monument to the White Citizens Council was the first Confederate monument that was removed in New Orleans. There's Colonel John Singleton Mosby and General William Little Billy Malone, who are organizers in Reconstruction efforts. <clears throat> Mosby is quoted as saying, I never heard of any cause for the Civil War but slavery. Finally, there is the leader of the Free State of Jones, Newton, Newt Knight, who was individually responsible for the killing of over 50 Confederates who tried to defeat the Free State of Jones. One could always remove the plaque from the rock and replace it with one to commemorate these real Southern heroes. I'm sorry, your time is up. My name is Dan Kelly, and I am a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. I have over 100 verified ancestors who fought for the South, and about 30 or 40 for the North. I, well, I didn't think this thing went this high. Let me fix that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to speak today, but I've heard so many different comments, and, and uh, I'd just like to, to maybe back up a little bit on some of the things that has, been, that has been discussed today, that history is distorted and misunderstood. Um, my... I have a great-great-grandfather who served the Confederacy, and I have a great-great-grandfather who served the Union, and they were next-door neighbors, and they fought in 1862 at Pea Ridge down in Arkansas. And my great-great-grandpa Kelly just, he could not, he couldn't fight his friends. He couldn't. And so he put in for a transfer, and he went to Kansas and he fought, he fought Native Americans and was mustered out in 1865 out of, the, out of the cavalry. Historically speaking, the war between the states was not about slavery in the beginning. If Lincoln wanted to abolish slavery, why didn't he do something after he was inaugurated president of the United States? In 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation did not include the northern states and the three, and the three border states, Maryland, Missouri, and Kentucky. Lincoln made the Civil War an issue of racism by freeing slaves in a country for which he had no jurisdiction because the Constitution gives the rights of the states to secede if they so choose. And that existed this very day in the state of Texas. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm with the Sons of Confederate Veterans. I grew up in a small town in Georgia. In the, I was born in 1958. I never met a black child until I was in the seventh grade. The scariest point of my life was when I saw the Klan carrying that flag down the street where I lived. 
I have 50 ancestors that fought for the Confederacy, and I have 10 that fought for the Union. 50% of my family that fought for the Confederacy were conscripts, if that word means anything to anyone in here, conscripts. My Union relatives, I have no, I don't, I, no one knows where they're buried. They're buried on some faraway field somewhere else. But the relatives that I have, their sons, went on to fight in World War I. If some of them are buried overseas now. I have relatives that went on to fight and uh, never came home from Los Negros Islands in the Philippines, never came home from Belgium in World War II. I have family that I have no idea where they're buried. I want to read a letter. My lovely wife, I do miss you so in the life we have there on that small plot of land that God has given us. More and more it seems that my thoughts are drifting back there to reside with you. Yet as badly as I desire to be home, it is for home for which I deem best my presence here with these other men. The proclamation by the Lincoln administration six months prior may appear to be noble. Were I here in these conditions simply to keep another man in bondage, I would most certainly walk away into the night and return to you and our home. God knows my heart and the hearts of the others amongst here with, who are here amongst who are here amongst me. We know what is at stake here, and the true reason for this contest requires the spilling of blood of fellow citizens on both sides. Our collective fear is universal. This, if this war is lost, we will see ripples carried forward for five, six, seven, or more generations. I scruple not to believe, as I do others, that the very nation of this country will be forever dispirited that one day our great-grandchildren will be bridled with a federal bit that will deem how and if they may apply the gospel of Christ to themselves, their families, and their communities. It will also decide whether or not the land of their forefathers may be deceitfully taken from them through taxation or coercion. A, dear, a day where only the interests of the northern wealthy will be shouldered by the broken and destitute bodies of the southern poor. This, my darling wife, is what keeps me here in this arena of destruction and death. Next up, we have Christopher Brush. Good evening. I'm uh, Christopher Brush. I'm also a veteran. I'm also son of a Confederate veterans member. Um, it seems we want to discuss unrepentant racist here tonight, and I think that's a pretty good thing to discuss. Let's discuss one. A member of the American Colonizational Society was Abraham Lincoln. The American Colonizational Society, which he was the head of a chapter of in Illinois, is dedicated to the superiority of the white man over the black. The president, 16th president of the United States advocated the removal of all black people from this country. He advocated it to the point where as late as 1864, he was discussing with the ambassador of Great Britain different places around the world where he could remove black people to, such as at that time, um, British Honduras, which is now Belize, or Brazil. It is possible that if Abraham Lincoln had not been assassinated in 1865 with the freedom of slaves, he would have wanted all blacks removed from this country, every one of them, including Frederick Douglass, who was quoted as saying, Abraham Lincoln is not the friend of the black man. If we are going to start removing statues of unrepentant racist. Should we not start with the Lincoln Memorial? I would say I would be fine with the removal of the monument in Washington Park as soon as we get rid of the Lincoln Memorial. If we can start there, I have no problem. But until the Lincoln Memorial is removed, I think we should leave the one in Washington Park alone, or at least remove it to a safer place such as Veterans Park. Thank you. Next up, we have Sadie Hernandez. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, my name is Sadie Hernandez and I was born and raised in Brownsville. And I'm here today to talk about why The Rock is stupid and it's literal trash. Um, I wanted, the first thing I wanted to point out about this rock is that nobody in this room is black. Nobody in here has the black experience and knows what it's actually like to be on the other end of this conversation that we shouldn't even be having without black people. Um, so second, I like your kiki hat. Um, I would also like to talk about just the anti-blackness that is here in this room. And it's honestly disgusting to know that we live in a city where we're literally fighting over a rock and it's people saying, leave the black people alone versus I hate black people, let's keep this rock. This rock is, was a marker for a highway that never got built. It's literally trash. There's no reason we should be out here fighting about it. Um, and from the perspective of a student on campus that does Mexican American studies and government, um, from the young perspective, there is less anti-blackness among us young Brownsvillians, for lack of a better word. Um, and to know that there's also a lack of young people here is also showing that being able to attend a town hall just shows that there is only a certain part of the population that gets to have these conversations versus you know an online thing that can reach thousands of people where this petition was actually shown to, to let us know that nobody wants this rock. It's a rock, you can move it to the museum where it's gonna go and nobody's gonna visit it. And the people who wanna visit it can go visit it there because when we have the rock at our Washington Park where we have Sombrero Fest and things like that, the only message that we're showing to tourists is we don't like black people here and we don't want you here. And so this is something that's really embarrassing, um, especially because I can't even, I, looking at this audience, it shows that there's not even that many people here that have interacted with black people on a daily basis. We don't have that many black people in our population. And to be talking about them without them here is really embarrassing for us as a, as a community to have public discourse about people that aren't included in the conversation. Thank you. Hello, members of the board, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And you know what I did notice is a really big uh, difference when it comes to the, to, to the age difference. Um, I'd like to ask the board a question. A lot of uh, comments here seem to be directed towards the audience, but you guys ultimately are the ones that are going to be uh, moving the rock, leaving it there, or no? Oh, okay. The, the city commission will be making the decision. This is just so that we can propose, uh, get the information that you all are okay. giving to us so that we can give them a report. Oh, but well. the city commission is the uh, ones that will ultimately make the decision. Well, we're obviously outnumbered here, but um, I'd like to ask a question. Did you know in modern day Germany that if you go around waving a Nazi flag or a Nazi statue, if you try to erect a Nazi statue, you will be imprisoned? Yes. Like, why is it so hard for us to condemn uh, the Confederate States when, when, I mean, Germany can condemn Nazis, which only happened, what, maybe 50, 60 years ago? And I hear a lot of, uh, I hear a lot of uh, talk about, oh, you're erasing history. Uh, history's gonna be taken away. Like, what do you think we do in school? Do you think we like twiddle our thumbs? Like there's textbooks, textbooks. We open and we read textbooks. And unfortunately, the American education system has failed a lot of people here because a lot of people think it was not about slavery. They say it's state rights. But when it comes to state rights, it was the right to own slaves. It was the right, they considered slaves property. How can you consider, can you look, can, can the board tell me if you can look at any of these people and consider them property? <laughs> it's, it's, it's laughable, really. I, I mean, how can we not condemn that? It, it's just to provoke thought. Real simple, I'm just gonna finish with Rafa. Wanted to say earlier, Rafael Collado, not Collado, Collado. 
you see one of the main and more insidious objectives of the lost cause was to reframe slavery as a benevolent institution instead of the Holocaust that it really was, as well as lying about the fact that the South seceded primordially to protect slavery. This movement was intellectually fueled by the writings of Edward Pollard, Edward Pollard, Jubal Early, Mildred Rutherford, and Merton Coulter, all of which espoused openly pro-slavery and white supremacy. But obviously the esp they espoused them everywhere else other than in the materials they utilized to revise history. That would expose their real intent. I appreciate your local leadership for finally addressing this issue and for their attempt at, uh, to democratize it with this event. Thank you, it appears as if what is in question today are the morals of having this monument on public grounds. Morality is relative, although history is not. I'm afraid to say that this can't be defined by how we all personally feel about it. There, can be, there can't be two official versions of history. The real question today is which one is our government going to endorse? With that said, I need to clarify something. A lot of people here have pointed out, I'm a veteran, I, I am a son of the Confederacy, I'm this, I'm that. My father-in-law fought in the Korean War in an integrated troop. He fought proudly and he basically said, the Confederacy has been tainted, tainted with white supremacy because that's what it is now. Thank you. I live in Brownsville, and I'm a fifth generation Texan. We've been in Texas since the 1870s. Um, I have uh, two great, great grandparents who fought in the Confederacy. They were part of a wonderful family, and it's a very big extended family, and I can't think of one member of this family that would be in favor of keeping this stone or this plaque in the park or any of these monuments throughout the South. Um, my sisters, my cousins, we all qualify for membership in the Daughters of the Confederacy. We certainly would not be in it. So um, uh, I just want to say one thing. <laughs> I don't think this is the place for us to be arguing the particulars of history. You know, it's very clear that the Confederacy was about slavery. So, but you know, that's not why we're here today. What we're here today, I think, is to talk about how people feel when they go into a park. I have lived in places where there are a lot of black people. I have black friends. I know that black people, and I can't speak for black people, and I agree with the previous speaker that it's pretty terrible that there's no black people here, but I can tell you that I don't think that parks, that people who run parks, want people to feel sad when they go into a park, or they want people to confront something that they didn't expect that makes them feel bad. That's how black people feel when they see these monuments. That's how people like me feel. When I go into the park and I see a monument like the one in Washington Park, I don't feel good. And I didn't go to the park to look at any kind of monument, particularly that would make me feel bad. Um, I think the same thing is true if it were moved over to the Veterans Park, which is right by the library, and which, by the way, we can imagine many veterans would go to who would be black or who would be hurt to see the stone in that park. I really believe that the stone should be in a museum. If people are not going to museums, maybe that's the issue. Maybe the museums need to be really funded better. Maybe there needs to be a lot more effort to get people into a history museum in this community. I think history is incredibly important. Um, but I don't think that either of these parks is a place, a proper place, a moral place, or even from your own point of view as administrators, a good place to have something like this monument. It makes people feel bad. It may make the majority of the people in this room feel good, but that's not what parks are about. Parks are about, about offering happiness, the pursuit of happiness to everybody. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm here today because I had to come to a pub public meeting due to my Texas government class. And <laughs> I, I just want to say that it's a tru truly an honor to be here. And I just want to, I, I wrote some things down. Um, I was one of the last ones to turn in the slip. So I went ahead and I wrote some things that I heard from everyone. Um, I'm just going to read it. I would like to say that wherever the monument goes is fine with me, but leave it in a place where the public can see it freely. Whether it's a museum, whether it stays in a park, whether it goes to the Veterans Park, it doesn't matter. As long as people appreciate our history, they will go visit it. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where this monument goes. If people really care, they'll go see it. Whether it's in a museum, whether it's in a park, whether it's in the Veterans Park, whether it's right in front of us, it doesn't matter. If people really care, they'll go out and see it. So that's one thing. Number two, coming from a family of veterans and knowing many veterans who serve for us, and by the way, everyone that served here and is here today, I salute you, I thank you, and I appreciate you for all the hard work that you put in for many years. Most of us maybe have visited this monument, maybe some of us haven't, but where, wherever it is, it should be somewhere publicly. And I also put something, history, History, let's talk about history. How long have this, has the stone been there and the plaque there in place for many years? How many of us have really taken the time to go see this monument? Whether, it was, it, whether it's there or whether it's not there, whether it's right in front of us, we should, we should be appreciated that we at least have history in, this, in the city of Brownsville. That's all I have to say about that. We have Richard T. Grant. Now this one's fine. I thought I had trouble hearing you guys. Thank you all first for coming out. Uh, first and foremost, let me thank all of the veterans who are in the audience. It's good to see so many of you guys out. Big round of applause, please, for all the veterans. I am also very pleased to see so many young people, young citizens coming out, whether it's for class or because you felt motivated to come out. It's good that you guys come out. We're very glad to see that because you all are the future of this community. Um, I have no objection to this monument being moved, but I'm also not someone that thinks it absolutely must go. The, the one message I would, I would convey to you guys, one is a citizen of Brownsville, born and raised in Brownsville. Uh, I'm also a very proud gay Hispanic American and resident of Brownsville. I'm very proud that one of the greatest things in this community is our local holiday. Sombrero Festival in Charades has grown in that park. It's the greatest representation, in my opinion, of how cultures can get along, how people can get along, how cities can get along, and how countries can get along. That has grown right around that monument. If that monument is promoting hate, it's a secret to a lot of us. Because I, I felt not sheltered growing up in Brownsville, but very blessed. Because I didn't hear words like KKK and hate until I left this community. And I'm very proud that that's what Brownsville was for so many years when I grew up. And to those of you guys who absolutely want to see it go, all I can say to you guys is don't be so hard with the message. It doesn't have to be a hate. It doesn't have to be an us versus them. Let's talk about what's best for our community and what's going to be the best resolution. And I think working together, we can get there. And I trust the elected leaders that you guys voted for to make the right decisions. Thank you. I apologize, I did not let any of the other uh, board members up here uh, get to make a statement. Tara, Nathan, Jose. Um, somebody said earlier that there was very little youth representation up here. This one. Um, I don't know how many of you know how old I am. I'm 17. I volunteered for this because I care about the community. 
I want to see it come together. It can be a lot better than just bickering about in this room over a pile of rocks. Mm. Maybe something would come out of here, some civic participation at least. But I just want us to work together, not against each other. Thank you for coming out. Good evening, my name is Damaris Malone. I am your City of Brownsville Parks and Recreation Director. And um, as many people have, will comment and say, there was not enough notice, we didn't publish it in the right places, there were, whatever that may be. Um, on <laughs> I'm sorry, that's my daughter. Um, <laughs> online, we do have the public comment form. We will still continue to accept, so if your friends did not get to comment, or someone wasn't able to attend, with, it is, this is not your one and only time. Um, our Parks Advisory Board meets on the 7th, so we will accept uh, additional comments at, at parks. The email parks.cob.us. You can email it to us, we'll get it, or you can email me, damaris.mcglone at cob.us, and we'll share it with the board. Again, the next steps. We'll be reporting back to the City Commission. Should the findings warrant another town hall, that may happen, and we will, again, notify social media, you know, press releases and um, flyers and whatnot. <laughs>